Good evening, everyone. I'm Doug Elmendorf, Dean of the Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome to the Kennedy School and the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. We are honored tonight to be joined by Ernest Meniz, a distinguished nuclear physicist and currently Secretary of Energy in the United States government. Secretary Meniz will be presenting this spring's Robert McNamara Lecture on War and Peace, entitled Science and Diplomacy for Solving Humanity's Big Issues, Iran, Highly Enriched Uranium, and Climate. As you know, Robert McNamara served as the US Secretary of Defense under Presidents Kennedy and Johnson, and was then President of the World Bank for 13 years. In those roles, he faced a daunting array of challenges around the world from the profound difficulty of ensuring peace among nations to the equally profound difficulty of reducing global poverty. At one point in his life, Robert McNamara said, to settle disputes without violence must become the primary goal of foreign policy for every nation. Therefore, the purpose of the Robert McNamara lecture is to explore ways to avoid violent conflict and resolve some of our greatest challenges peacefully. We at the Kennedy School are grateful to the McNamara and Pastor families for their ongoing support of this opportunity to explore these important topics. Through this lecture series, the Kennedy School has brought to Harvard world leaders who are developing new ideas and new directions for action to meet the challenges of today's world. We have been fortunate in the past few years to have heard from Robert Zellick, who is Deputy Secretary of State and President of the World Bank, Mohammed al baradi the Egyptian scholar and diplomat, William Perry, who is Secretary of Defense, and others. And tonight, we continue this illustrious tradition with Ernie Moniz. We are fortunate to have as our moderator, Professor Graham Allison. Uh, Graham Allison is the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and the Douglas Dillon Professor of Government at the Harvard Kennedy School. Graham was the founding dean of the modern Kennedy School which grew 20-fold in his 12 years as dean to become the leading school of public policy and government in the world. Graham has written numerous best-selling books about foreign policy. He served as special advisor to the Secretary of Defense under President Reagan, as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Policy and Plans under President Clinton, and a member of the Defense Policy Board for six Secretaries of Defense. He's been awarded the Department of Defense's a highest civilian award, the Distinguished Public Service Medal, on two occasions. And he has been a wonderful source of advice and support for me as I've begun as dean. Let's welcome Graham Allison. Thank you very much for such a kind remarks. It's a, a, a great honor uh, as director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs to welcome uh, here to Harvard tonight the premier scientist statesman of modern times. And I, I, I say that very carefully. Uh, I, I, I don't think I can identify, and I've done some historical research, a scientist who, in his role as a scientist, had greater impact on a major national security negotiation than our guest tonight. And so the question before the House tonight uh, is how lessons learned from a scientist uh, with his impact in reaching an agreement with Iran about nuclear weapons may be applicable to other issues like climate or maybe even the life sciences. And that's the assignment that Ernie's going to talk to us about tonight. The there's a long history of scientists playing big roles in national security. Obviously, Einstein, Vannevar Bush, actually the president of Harvard, President Kona, played an absolutely crucial role. So it would be a very nice case study or a book even for someone to pursue the role of scientist statesman or scientist statescraft. And I'm fascinated to hear, as I've heard from Ernie once or twice about this in the Iran case, but also to see what the, were the lessons for people studying at a school of government, or what are lessons for people studying in the physics department or at MIT. So just to remind you a little bit about it, here are the negotiations uh, between 
the, two, the, the quartet, in effect, Secretary Kerry, who was here back in the fall, Secretary Moniz, and their counterparts, Zarif and Salehi. Next slide, please. Here was the team, as you've seen Wendy Sherman, who had been a fellow with the IOP, talking about the negotiations here in the forum again more recently. The team who were working this out. When the things got really tough, though, as Wendy puts it, go to the next slide. So these two folks would sit down, two scientists. One uh, had been the chairman of the nuclear uh, physics department at MIT. One had got his PhD in nuclear physics at MIT. Not uh, inconsequential. Next slide, please. So we're very happy here at the Kennedy School that whenever Ernie goes looking for a deputy, the deputy secretary of energy, it seems to be a Kennedy School person. So these are two people, Dan Poneman, who's sitting over here, wave your hand there, who was the deputy secretary when Ernie arrived, and Liz Sherwood, who was a research fellow here, who's now currently his secretary of energy. And next slide, please. Everybody knows about Donald Trump's art of the deal. Ernie made a YouTube that you can go check out called The Science of the Deal. And I'm going to be interested to see how the art and the science go together. Finally, uh, to suggest uh, what a serious fellow we have here, uh, Secretary Moniz is proud of the fact that he's a kid from Fall River, which is a place that most of you here in Massachusetts probably have not even heard about, but where there are many fishermen, and that's actually a gene that he's carried with him. So if we go to this last slide, you can't see quite well, but one of the, one of the rewards for negotiating about climate is you get to go to Alaska, and one of the rewards of going to Alaska is you sometimes catch a silver salmon. So we're very honored to have Secretary Moniz here tonight. Thank you, Graham, uh, especially for not pointing out in that uh, science behind the Iran deal slide, the typical physicist's desk behind me, <laughs> piled up with papers in a completely random fashion. But uh, anyway, it's great to be here, and, and, and thanks uh, to both of you, and a uh, uh, pleasure to be here for this uh, McNamara uh, lecture. Uh, Graham, uh, said that uh, correctly that we had an interesting discussion uh, a while back uh, in which uh, he emphasized this idea of the intersection of, uh, of, of science and, and, and diplomacy and how it played out in, in, the, in the Iran uh, negotiations, but then also uh, might there be some lessons learned in terms of uh, thinking about other uh, of the many, many problems uh, facing us uh, internationally that, that involve science. So, uh, I'm not claiming that I'm going to answer the, the, that question very crisply, but, uh, but at least I can, I can describe some of what we did and, and a few other areas that I think may qualify. Uh, certainly when I was uh, a simple New England physicist uh, thrust into the diplomatic role, uh, you know, I was, had to figure out what this meant and my colleague uh, Jeff Hughes uh, said it was very simple, as Adlai Stevenson uh, said, protocol, geritol alcohol. Uh, I, uh, I have known to have had some practice uh, in the last, uh, although it was not very helpful in a direct negotiation with the Iranians. Uh, the, the, uh, the protocol was, of course, hopeless, but the, the geritol, uh, I have to say, it just reminded me of the Federal Trade Commission uh, investigation uh, that led to a court finding that their claims, Geritol's claims, were, quotes, um, amounted to gross negligence and bordered on recklessness. So that was my introduction to what diplomacy was about. I figured I, figured I, could, I could do that. But uh, um, before getting to the Iran deal, um, let me make a couple of first general points. Uh, and, uh, and, and one is that uh, the Department of Energy, um, this is my, by the way, my second time around the track uh, at, uh, at, uh, at DOE. Uh, should, it should understand, we have a broad set of missions, uh, but it's fundamentally a science organization. Uh, the Department of Energy is, is really 
really about bringing science uh, and technology to bear uh, on, uh, on, on important missions. Uh, a, a critical asset for that is our 17 uh, national laboratories uh, that we uh, draw upon uh, a, a very, uh, uh, very much with about 100,000 uh, staff uh, serving, by the way, in addition, uh, nearly 35,000 scientists from around the country uh, with unique facilities. But again, my point is, again, it's, it's, a, it's a science organization. It does have two major missions of clear, significant international significance. One is nuclear security, uh, from the nuclear deterrent to, uh, to controlling and removing nuclear materials, non-proliferation, uh, preventing, hopefully preventing nu nuclear terrorism. So that is a major role uh, for the department. Uh, and the second is addressing the climate uh, change issues, not only the science of climate change, but also looking for the solutions through clean energy uh, technology uh, innovation. Uh, and it's uh, fortunate, <laughs> I very much enjoy the, the, the privilege of, of having this role now at a time, particularly when the President, President Obama, has put both of these issues extremely high uh, on, on his agenda. Uh, but I do want to emphasize in all of this, I hope I will say it again, but I, just in case I forget, remind, I remind you, you should always say, uh, remember, that behind all of this activity, is especially this national laboratory system uh, carrying out technically grounded analysis, uh, I think, of, of the, highest, the highest quality. The second uh, general comment I would make before getting into some of the specifics is that you know, we all recognize diplomacy uh, as the, uh, the art and the practice of, of um, conducting negotiations uh, between, between countries, um, but um, the dictionary also reminds us that it's more than that. Uh, uh, for example, it's the work of maintaining good relations between governments, which often, of course, is the predicate for being able to accomplish the first, the, the, uh, the negotiation. So in that sense, I'd like to also emphasize, and in the, sci in the scientific uh, intersection here, that uh, uh, while typically the negotiations are done by the diplomats, diplomats and a lot of others, including scientists, are working that other part of the problem uh, in terms of laying the foundations uh, through people-to-people -people exchange, through government-to-government -government exchange, uh, uh, that, that, is, that is so, uh, uh, so critical. So um, again, th so those were uh, two pieces of context that I really wanted to, to, to put out there. Now, um, Let's turn to um, uh, Iran, um, and then I'll turn to some other uh, issues. Um, the, the negotiation fundamentals, you know, were, were obviously were evident uh, from the beginning. Uh, it's about Iran uh, substantially rolling back its nuclear uh, enterprise, verifiably, uh, uh, in return for economic sanctions relief. I mean, that's obviously the basic premise. Uh, now that leaves a lot to uh, uh, to to define, uh, obviously. Um, uh, but uh, the situation uh, in uh, early 2015, which is when the negotiation took on a different character uh, by adding uh, the kind of the scientist channel to the uh, to the Kerry Zarif um, uh, uh, Foreign Ministry, if you like, traditional uh, channel. As I, I want to emphasize, as a complement. Uh, uh, to that, uh, to those discussions, uh, the negotiations were frankly at a standstill, uh, and uh, it was pretty clear that um, the negotiations were uh, not producing uh, technical approaches for this complicated rollback of the nuclear system uh, that were acceptable uh, to the scientific establishment uh, in uh, in Iran. So uh, Dr. Salehi, who uh, Graham already uh, introduced, um, simply needed to be at the table. Uh, and that uh, then meant that I did as well um, uh, to, to have that channel um, uh, function in parallel with the, 
uh, political economic um, uh, uh, discussions. Now, obviously, uh, relationships are, are critical, uh, and uh, Graham alluded to the fact that uh, we did have uh, no personal relationship uh, uh, but when we started, uh, but, um, but a common history uh, at MIT. And I won't go through all of that, although we can later on if you wish, but, but, uh, but that matters. Um, but even more so, I would say, is it's very clear uh, I think that if one is going to succeed in this kind of business, you have to work hard at trying to understand what the other person thinks, uh, what's important to them, et cetera, et cetera. And I have to say uh, something that is not so much at a the personal level here, but more generic, that the fact that we both came from scientific traditions, uh, uh, in this case from the same, had uh, a common uh, common un university experience, uh, really, I think, uh, helped with that a lot. Because uh, we both had kind of a scientific view of the world, were able to frame questions in ways that we certainly understood quite well, uh, and, uh, and we, could go, we could go forward with that. Clearly, we had to understand the core objectives very early on, the core needs that we just had to have uh, for our uh, respective governments, and I should have said, by the way, uh, I'll be talking about this in terms of the, our, our discussions with the Iranians, but I do want to emphasize a critical component was that on, on our side, if you like, it was the P5 plus one in the EU. We had kind of the lead negotiating responsibility, but in always in concert with our partners uh, to make sure we were all together going forward. And in fact, if I skip ahead and just for a moment now to the end, I'll come back to where we are, but to the end, it, the coherence of the P5 plus one in EU is itself a major story and a major reason for the success of the agreement. And I remind you, this is at a time when, for example, the US and Russia have a few other things to work out, but the common commitment to this uh, and the fact that we were shoulder to shoulder to shoulder to shoulder to shoulder uh, is, is extremely important. And it's also one of the reasons why, if I skip again to a punchline, uh, for the United States to even contemplate unilaterally reversing this agreement would be a tremendous mistake because, in fact, the effectiveness of the sanctions regime derived from the coherence of the international community and our deciding to walk away means we walk away alone. Uh, and this would uh, not be a very, uh, very uh, smart thing to do. So let me go, coming back to the, core, to the core objectives and needs, the key is, is that a set of objectives and needs on both sides that does not exclude all solutions? We rapidly came to the conclusion that that was not the case. Uh, frankly, I mean, our objectives became pretty simple we needed to have what's called a one-year breakout time. How much time would it take for Iran in a full sprint to assemble the nuclear materials for a first nuclear weapon? We defined that to be the breakout time. Admittedly, it's not the conventional one. It's a more conservative one uh, than the conventional one. Uh, but we, need, we insisted that we must have that for a substantial period of time and that we must have strong verification measures that some of which at least go on in effect forever. That's what we needed on the nuclear side. What the Iranians needed was the ability to carry on at some level all of the activities that they were doing in the, in the peaceful nuclear space and to eventually have none of their standard prerogatives compromised in terms of being able to pursue a peaceful nuclear program. It's pretty clear. Those do not exclude all solutions. And so now the question was to find something that could work in a very complicated situation with many, many technical parameters uh, uh, going, going forward. In a, in a nutshell, I mean, I'm not going to go through all the, all the specifics. Uh, uh, this was achieved. Uh, the fundamental structure 
is that in the end, uh, they have significant constraints on their program for 15 years, uh, a dramatically reduced uh, nuclear program, uh, whether it's for in, in how much plutonium is made and how much enrichment is done, what R&D is done, uh, all these aspects uh, are rolled back substantially for 15 years, and I'm happy to discuss uh, specifics uh, uh, later on. In addition, novel in any nonproliferation agreement act, uh, actions or agreements in not simply rejecting nuclear weapons, but rejecting even the research and development on weaponization activities. That is not in any other agreement. And a set of unique verification measures. For example, and again, I don't want to get too I want to go much into the weeds here, but the additional protocol uh, is the key instrument for having the IAEA, the international inspectors, have access uh, to sites that have not been declared to be nuclear sites. The loophole is there's no time limit. This agreement has a time limit. There must be a response within a fixed time frame or uh, they are out of compliance. We have a procurement channel for any kind of controlled items that may be useful. Um, uh, we have surveillance by the IAEA of the manufacturing of centrifuge parts for 20 years. We have the first ever surveillance of the uranium supply chain for 25 years, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really uh, quite a, uh, a, a strong uh, um, uh, agreement. It breaks some new ground. And, uh, and I think, and others have stated that it would be terrific if a lot of these elements could become a model for other nonproliferation agreements. Let me make it very clear. I did not say that was the view of the P5 plus one, uh, but it's my personal view, and I agree with others, Dick Garwin and others, who have, who have put, that, uh, put that forward. I would just note that, <clears throat> so that, that's kind of the basics of it, and I hope it gives you some flavor of it, and uh, we can discuss it more, but um, I want to note this verification issue is absolutely critical. Certainly for the president, it was an absolute, absolute anchor of this, that we had to have strong verification measures for obvious reasons. But I just want to note, in the broader sense of nuclear security and negotiations, verification is almost always a big deal and a tough one to get. Uh, obviously, by, by definition, it's intrusive uh, and, uh, and creates big problems. But just to think back, and I, and I consulted with my good friend Jim Timby, uh, uh, that, uh, and certainly many people here will remember all of this, but you take the INF, the Interme Intermediate Range uh, Nuclear Forces Treaty, you know, X-ray scanning of missiles coming in railroad cars out of production fac factories to distinguish between what's allowed and what's not allowed. Kind of amazing, actually. Uh, the st start, the exchange of telemetry tapes and data uh, for limits on the number of reentry vehicles and throw weight. Uh, the HEU deal, the megatons to megawatts uh, deal, uh, and Jeff Hughes and Jim Timby and I were critical, actually, had critical roles in, in negotiating uh, that, uh, uh, the, the restart of that deal in the late 90s. I don't know if Tom Neff is here, but uh, he was the kind of father of the concept. Uh, anyway, uh, but on the verification side, the issue was, how do we know the low enriched uranium is coming from high enriched uranium in the weapons program? And that required new technology. Our, lab, our labs, again, invented the technology to follow the blending streams to make sure. The CTBT, um, uh, uh, ratification is the last part of a negotiation, and things like the seismic monitoring network and the highly technical discussions of what is the meaning, what would be the value of extremely low nuclear, nuclear yield tests below a threshold of, of detection. So I just want to emphasize the role of science and technology in these agreements and often in the verification side 
is uh, is a kind of a, a almost a constant uh, in this uh, in in this business. Before leaving nuclear, let me note a failed negotiation, uh, and that was at the end of the Clinton administration. I was Under Secretary of Energy at the time, uh, uh, negotiating with Russia uh, and their minister Adamov, a, a very technical person, who seemed to only want, would only talk to technical people. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, this was about a, a comprehensive fuel cycle discussion which would have moved the ball forward dramatically. Um, it failed because after we thought we had understood what the core objectives and needs were, leaving the possibility of a solution, it turns out there was one they hadn't told us uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that's a lesson as well uh, in terms of uh, the ability to carry forward these, these negotiations. But I would say the global nuclear fuel cycle, fuel cycle, enrichment, reprocessing, fuel fabrication, all of this is very much a present issue. Frankly, the Iran, the Iran agreement raises the visibility of this for the Middle East in particular. And this is a, a good example, I think, of where we need to bring together, uh, again, science and diplomacy uh, to see what we can do. Now, we think the answer is very clear. Dan Poneman, John Deutsch, and I, and the fourth, Gary Seymour, our editor, we gave the answer in 2004. The Assured Nuclear Fuel Services Initiative uh, uh, a form of fuel leasing. Now, there are be other ideas, um, uh, and we did say at that time that Iran would be the test case. It hasn't worked out quite the way we had in mind, uh, but, but this is a great example of a critical nuclear security problem and nuclear energy problem that needs to be readdressed with this intersection of science and diplomacy. Finally, let me just turn uh, to a few remarks on climate and clean energy. Uh, <clears throat> This is another case where the Department of State and the Department of Energy, uh, with strong White House coordination, uh, worked in parallel and I think with very good synergy. The most obvious thing is the COP21, the Paris negotiations, uh, and uh, where obviously the State Department uh, leads that very complex uh, multilateral negotiation. Uh, Senator Kerry, uh, uh, in no small way uh, helped by Todd Stern. Uh, uh, obviously, along with all the other countries and our, and our allies, uh, delivered what I think was a very, very strong agreement uh, in terms of addressing at least the first stage of uh, uh, carbon uh, uh, emissions uh, reductions. But it was evident, now I'll talk about the less obvious stra uh, strand, the it was evident early in 2015 that some key countries needed to be encouraged uh, towards greater ambition. And that's especially true in the emerging and developing economies, especially the larger emerging economies. Um, collectively, the world will certainly need considerably more ambition in kind of the post-2030 period, even if all the commitments in Paris are fulfilled because we know it's a great start but we've got a long way to go afterwards and we're going to have to keep driving uh, carbon down uh, dramatic, dr dramatically. So this is the link to DOE. Clean energy uh, innovation uh, that continues to lower the costs of clean energy as we have seen very impressively over the last decade in, in many technologies continuing that kind of trajectory and in fact, enlarging it to even more technologies can be the underpinning of increased ambition because lower costs equate to greater ambition. In fact, Prime Minister Modi, uh, who was a key player uh, in what I'll be talking about, uh, stated exactly that in those words. You give me lower cost, I, I can be more ambitious going forward. And that's, and that's a, broad, a broad statement. So, um, so we started to build this innovation theme as a core element of the road to Paris and of course for the road from Paris. So around mid-year, 
we met with Minister uh, Fabius, Foreign Minister of France, the president of COP21, uh, and talked about this innovation theme, and so it came to pass. Innovation uh, was given a much more prominent role uh, in, uh, in, in the Paris talks than it had been the case before. I might say there was a little bit of a spin-off here as well in that the relationship with Fabius had developed in the Iran negotiations of the P5 plus one. And so uh, that was kind of a nice, a nice benefit. Uh, but then uh, we and, and Fabius uh, also met almost at the same time with Bill Gates, who has long advocated a very substantial increase uh, in clean energy R&D and, and innovation uh, to meet our, uh, our climate challenge. The result was on the first day of COP21, the last day was, the, was the, the climate agreement, but the first day was an announcement of two parallel initiatives. One is called Mission Innovation, in which 20 countries, uh, representing almost 85% of the world's energy R&D funding, agreed to seek a doubling of R&D over a five-year timescale, open up the innovation pipeline, if you like, present more investable opportunities to the, to, the, to the Breakthrough Energy Coalition and others, but the Breakthrough Energy Coalition specifically pulled together by Bill Gates, 28 investors from 10 countries, very deep pockets, uh, prepared to pursue those investable opportunities with unusual patience, 20 years, unusual risk appetite, and a willingness to go end to end to the scale up of these technologies in the marketplace, which in the energy, those of you know the energy sector, those are three big challenges uh, for getting, uh, getting the kinds of investments that we want. So, uh, so this was again, uh, a, in, the, in the United States government, this was these, these initiatives, negotiating the, pa the climate deal and pushing the innovation was something that we worked on together, recognizing uh, that this was a way of trying to leverage ambition now and leveraging ambition in the future going forward. Now there's gonna be a lot of climate negotiation left to do uh, for a lot of years and a lot of decades. Uh, I just say that uh, one of the issues again will be verification. Uh, we mentioned that in the nuclear side, but the verification issue uh, eventually has to be addressed uh, squarely. And again, both technical and diplomatic solutions are gonna have to be called for. It's another area I think of, which is uh, extremely important. Uh, as I said, we're going to need more ambition. That will not be easy either, even as we succeed in innovation, especially as we have countries at very different stages of development. So that's another area where I think the combination of the of the kind of the technology and, uh, and diplomatic perspectives uh, will, be, will be important. Uh, and um, uh, this is obviously one of the great challenges that, well, certainly the students in this room are gonna be facing for, for, for several decades. I'll just end by throwing out another one where this is, this is more to inflame passion, uh, but an area where uh, I think that I personally believe we should be much more active in combining science and diplomatic perspectives now, hopefully never having to rely upon it, geoengineering. Uh, I think that personally, I always like options. Uh, and uh, this is one which I think has considerable risk, at least many of the, many of the options. Uh, it's not a favorite option, but I think this is the kind of thing that, especially in an environment like this, combining science and diplomatic uh, perspectives uh, to see where the risks are and where the opportunities are is very important. Another critical issue in the, in the climate domain. As Graham said, there are so many other areas where where, where science and diplomacy didn't come together, but I think I will just leave it at that with, uh, with those two, uh, which as I say, are major responsibilities in the, uh, in the Department of Energy. Thank you.
those of us as citizens, uh, I uh, say we're thankful for your service. And for those of us as colleagues, to think of a scientist who's got this entangled in the business and is thinking about the array of opportunities, I think is, is an inspiration, actually, should be for, you could do, do this for MIT as well, and as well as for more of the scientists in the university. So, Graham, you always go in only one direction. <laughs> the political scientists should take physics. Well, I was going to say that <laughs> as a political scientist, I can tell you there's probably some reason why political scientists don't take <laughs> physics and why physicists don't care much for political scientists. But that's a longer story. So uh, Ernie and I uh, make bets on various things. We're not doing any tonight, but I'd say to, to try to appreciate uh, what was accomplished in the Iranian nu nuclear negotiations is pretty difficult now because the, the hand of history is so heavy that after something happens, we pocket it and move on as if, well, of course, this agreement was going to be reached. But I always try to ask people, what if? Okay, so if no agreement had been reached, what would we be talking about today? It would be most likely the third war in the Middle East that occurred because we were not able to stop the advance of the Iranian nuclear program, and either the Israelis or we, or together, we attacked it, and then what, what would happen from there? So when you parachuted into the problem, uh, what odds would you have given on a, on a solution? If that's, and when did, when did you enter directly into the negotiation, and how did you make the odds at that point? Well, obviously, uh, you know, a simple extrapolation uh, uh, from where one, where one was at that point uh, uh, would not have given one a lot of encouragement. But I, to be honest, and maybe it's again, maybe it's the scientist mentality, but uh, I think in pretty short order uh, with, you know, recognizing uh, the seriousness of uh, uh, Salehi uh, in the negotiations, uh, the fact that uh, we could establish a rapport very quickly uh, uh, and a trust, uh, a, again, a, a trust in the sense of believing that you know, the other person is, not, is, is putting forward uh, serious positions that they can back. Uh, it became also very clear early on that uh, he couldn't make decisions. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier, it became clear very on uh, uh, became clear uh, early on uh, that uh, when we stripped it down to the core objectives and needs, there was space for a solution. Uh, and so in that case, I always feel, well, eventually we'll, we'll, we'll engineer it. Now, I'm talking about the nuclear, the nuclear side. Uh, uh, John Kerry and Javad Zarif obviously were, uh, had also an intense negotiation uh, going on uh, on the sanctions and other issues, um, uh, and, and that was also going to be difficult. But I have to tell you, to be honest, uh, I felt it was not going to be a walk in the park, and it was not, uh, but that I felt we were going to get there. I really did. Let me push one I, more. I think, if I may yeah. say, Graham, I think the, the issue which uh, I, I think is, uh, it's even more, even more difficult in a certain sense is seeing our way to sustain the program for a long time. A, on the Iranian side, of course, they haven't sustained this for many years. But I remind you, on our side, you know, the good news is, for the first time, there is surveillance of the Iranian supply chain for 25 years. The bad news, it's 25 years. <laughs> and that is going to require a you know, sustained attention and resources for a very long time uh, in, in our support of the uh, support of the IAEA in that in that case. So let me push on it just to one more one more round, as we were discussing earlier. So, if you were taking a class at the Kennedy School or at the Business School in negotiation, they would say, just uh, search out the others' bottom lines to see whether there's a zone of agreement. And then if there's a zone of agreement, at least you then have a chance of reaching it. So that doesn't sound to me like right. physics. I think that's, you know, 
what that's, what, that's what I want. So the, but, but Zarif and Kerry, who had been negotiating now for quite a long time, and who certainly were able to figure that part out, were not able to do some other things that the Minister of Atomic Energy from Iran and the Secretary of Energy from the US were able to do. So those were things that you as physicists and as uh, secretaries of departments having some capabilities, some assets, some authority. So how did that part make it possible to negotiate something that I would not have been able to negotiate if I had simply been the US negotiator doing the diplomacy side of this? Well, I think the, the, the key is, uh, and again, each thing is unique and this is a very special situation, but I think the key is that, uh, again, Iran and, and Salehi understood this completely uh, while preserving some activity uh, in the various areas that they had advanced, recognized that there had to be a very substantial rollback. Uh, in some sense, it's, maybe it's ironic. He could handle that better than others lower in the organization or younger in their career, to be perfectly honest. So, uh, so a lot of this had to be done in the way one of your photographs uh, had it, uh, with the two of us at a table, uh, having the competence and the knowledge to be able to make the kinds of trade-offs that we were talking about, uh, often uh, kind of a real-time uh, 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 situation. Uh, again, that, that's not gonna be a case in many other negotiations, I'm sure, but here it was. And I think the root of it was that he had to come prepared, and he was prepared uh, to make tough decisions uh, uh, and I think I had the uh, ability to make some decisions as well on our side uh, that we could just go forward. It, it just wasn't going to happen uh, I, in this case, I think, with the kind of traditional backbench analytical support uh, uh, to, to, move, to move forward. I'm going to put one more question and then we're going to go to the audience where there are microphones both on the floor and at the loge if you'll line up. But Ernie, you, we had, were talking about this before. So most people don't really appreciate what are the labs and, what, and the ways in which, at least for this secretary, they became part of the, almost the, the back, backdrop for your uh, having a problem, asking them to go model something overnight, come back with a new solution, think about a different way to do verification, uh, uh, think about what the consequences of, of the, the number of centrifuges you would leave. Again, partly because you were a scientist who was familiar with almost every, everything from the atom to the, to, the, uh, to the production facility, you were able to ask questions and get back up from this structure that I don't think of other negotiations making use of in in an analogous manner. So maybe just give people a little uh, account of that. Because I don't even know whether, whether this is new for labs doing this, that. Th th of course labs have always been part of the arms control negotiations in the back, but the report comes like in a month or maybe in three months. And you were doing overnight cycles. So give a little explanation. Yeah, so, so first of all, Graham, the, the uh uh, I want to make it absolutely clear, the, the, the laboratories, and by the way, I say laboratories, but we actually had, it gives you an idea of the complexity here. This negotiation alone, we had seven national laboratories and two nuclear sites in addition uh, engaged. So nine of our facilities were uh, engaged. They were engaged from the beginning of the negotiation because after all, the, you know, the major repository of nuclear science and technology is at our, is at our laboratories. So they were, they were always, always involved. Uh, and frankly, I should also say, I mean, I was involved as well from the first, from becoming secretary in the sense of uh, the internal government meetings uh, because of the, the, the support role that we had at that time. Uh, now the difference uh, uh, when the negotiation was expanded 
uh, is that uh, it is true, as, as you say, that uh, because we had such intense uh, discussions uh, uh, with, you know, with Salehi uh, on, on these issues, then, and <laughs> good, bad, or indifferent, the fact is we were doing a lot of this, you know, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, that does tend to speed things up. Uh, and uh, in that context, uh, it's important to be able to ask the right questions, and I probably was able to, more able than others perhaps, to, uh, to ask those questions about what we needed. But, but there was always a strong group there. Again, we mentioned uh, Mr. Timby from the Department of State, a, a physicist legend, uh, unfortunately retired uh, at the end of the last month. Um, uh, but we also had uh, DOE scientists uh, present, and so this would be the interface back to a very large establishment uh, here, here in the States. As I mentioned earlier, uh, nine hours time difference to Livermore Laboratory actually helps in the negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we're in Vienna, it does. Okay, so the, we're going to the floor. Please introduce yourself briefly and ask a question, and it, Ends with a question mark. This gentleman, please. Mohammad Reza Jalaipur from Harvard CNES. Since you got to know the other negotiators personally throughout the course of intense negotiations you had, how influential and game-changing do you think was the personal diplomatic and negotiation skills of Javad Zarif and John Kerry? If their predecessors were still in office, do you think we, have, we could have arrived at this result still? Look, I think uh, a, a, a negotiation is always uh, the building up of, of the appropriate kind of trust and relationship. Uh, uh, I mean, at least if you want to proceed in any kind of uh, reasonably efficient uh, uh, way. I can't say I would call this efficient overall, but anyway. Uh, so I think you know you have you have uh, the the occupants of those positions obviously change with time. They will be changing again, um, uh, presumably in nine months. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, you know I, I think whoever is are, are, in, is are in those roles are going to have a job to do, uh, and and will do it. Clearly, personalities matter, uh, and uh, and I do think that Kerry and Zarif, just as Salehi and I developed uh, a good relationship. I think uh, sometimes uh, it was more volatile, uh, but um, and we had actually very interesting lectures on Persian history um, um, at many points. Uh, but uh, look, we all worked together, and we got there. And I, you know, I, and uh, I think the, the, this particular case, having a scientist uh, in, in that in, in in the roles in both sides, was important. But I would not make it so personality dependent, as opposed to, you know, uh, where you sit is is uh, is is uh, is very important. Let me take Pro Professor Matt Vaughn. I didn't see you were there. Huh. Please. Uh, Hi. Professor Bund uh, runs the Managing the Atom Project here at the Kennedy School. Yes. Hi. I wondered if you could reflect a little on the connection between two of the things you talked about, uh, nuclear energy and climate, and uh, what you see as the most important obstacles constraining the ability of nuclear energy to uh, grow enough to be a major part of the solution and um, what we could do about those obstacles and what we could do about managing the risks that might arise from such a growth of nuclear energy. And how much of that is institutional things, policy things like your article, and how much of that is new technologies from your perspective? Wasn't that five questions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, complicated question, but Matt's got a complicated mind, yes. <laughs> the, um, so I'll respond to some of the questions, uh, the, ones that are, the ones that I can remember. Uh, the, uh, first of all, I think the, the, uh, uh, we certainly believe that nuclear power uh, has to be an option on the table uh, to meet, uh, meet low-carbon, uh, the kinds of low-carbon goals we're talking about, particularly in the, in the, long, in the long term. Uh, now, having said that, uh, the barriers and the prospects 
are very, very different in different places. Uh, certainly, uh, globally, you go from, say, Germany that has committed to complete phase out of nuclear power to China that has committed to uh, an enormous uh, and is executing uh, a, a very aggressive uh, plan for, for building nuclear energy. If you look in even within the United States, it kind of applies. Uh, it is not an accident that the new plants being built are all in the southeast. It's got to do with the regulatory structures uh, there uh, because it's hard to risk $15 billion uh, in a uh, competitive market uh, without having some, some, some assurance of, uh, of, uh, of cost recovery. So, uh, so I think it's, it's going to remain a little bit uh, geographically spotty, but still could be, uh, could be significant. Uh, the issue of uh, one area that I'm uh, very interested in at least finding out the answer is to see whether uh, small modular reactors can be um, uh, helpful, particularly in addressing uh, the financing uh, uh, structural uh, problems. Uh, that remains to be seen. But what I would recommend is that you talk to John Deutsch, who is currently uh, chairing a uh, Secretary of Energy Advisory Board committee on how nuclear power uh, is going to grow or what it would take for it to grow uh, in the United States. The gentleman in the lodge, please. Uh, yes, I uh, wanted to congratulate you. Well, first, my name is Mahmoud Katabi, and I'm with Admins Inc. in Cambridge. Uh, looking at the document that is negotiated, it seems to me highly improbable that this agreement could have been reached without a major scientific approach to the problem because you need to have a PhD in nuclear physics really to completely understand the nuances that is going on. So uh, congratulations on that, uh, on that regard. Uh, my real question is that the critics of the deal without really understanding the scientific dimensions of what's going on, they are saying that you did not negotiate hard enough. Could you tell us whether this, there is any fact to this? This is, of course, the party that, you know, the Republican Party is criticizing the agreement as, uh, well, some of them reject it all the way, and the other ones that accept it, they say you did not negotiate hard enough. Could you shed some light on that? Well, um, uh, first of all, let me observe that most of the criticisms of the deal are not actually criticisms of the deal. They are criticisms of what <laughs> the deal is not. Uh, so does it resolve the ballistic missile problem? No. Does it resolve uh, arms to Hezbollah? No, I can go on. But it wasn't supposed to. I mean, the deal was intentionally chosen to focus on what had been discussed as the existential threat of a nuclear weapon uh, in Iran uh, and the determination of really a world community to make sure that that never happened because of what the consequences would be all around. So I might also add that that is not unlike, and you know, Analogies are ne never perfect, but it's not unlike uh, in the in President Reagan's administration. You know, negotiating arms control agreements uh, with the Soviet Union uh, and not trying to have some grand bargain that addresses proxy wars and Jewish immigration and and all kinds of other issues. So, so if one wanted to challenge that premise of negotiating on the nuclear weapon issue. That discussion should have been had a long time ago. Uh, now, with regard to the deal itself, I would say the only critique that I really uh, believe is worth discussing, frankly, there are a lot of others that I think are not worth discussing. Now, but you can always question why 15 years? 
Why not 25 years? Wouldn't that be better? Well, yeah. <laughs> That's what a negotiation is. Uh, and, uh, but I, I would say that is the only uh, real issue there. And, um, and even that, I think the answer is, well, OK, we have 15 years of constraints, ser significant constraints on a nuclear program with strong verification measures that go on. And they get some economic relief versus a nuclear program that would have continued, presumably continued to grow very, very fast, challenging assumptions about what we might do um, without verification and, of course, without the economic relief. However, I would observe all those other problems that we've been talking about, Houthis, Hezbollah, et cetera, they don't seem to have been particularly resource constrained. So um, no, no question where I come down in yeah. terms of uh, uh, the balance. I think it's very, very clear. Uh, and uh, look, we would love to see, obviously, the uh, other aspects of Iran's behavior, Mo you know, moderate, modified, uh, have Iran really rejoin uh, the international community uh, uh, in what, I would say, more responsible way uh, relative to those other issues. Um, uh, but make no mistake about it. That would be great if it happens. Check back in a decade, but right now, this is a deal based upon verification and rollback and removing that existential threat. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emily Shoren. I'm a senior at MIT. And I'd like to ask a question about something you haven't talked about tonight. What's your major? Uh, course one, environmental <laughs> engineering. Uh, so about a year ago, almost to this day, the DOE published the first ever quadrennial energy review. So I was wondering, so this made about 60 or so recommendations, and I'm wondering how effective this document has been, and sort of what are the future iterations of it that you're looking at now? Did Melanie Kenderdine plant that question? <laughs> uh, if you want to follow up in more detail, talk to this person here uh, with a hand up, right? So, um, so the Quadrennial Energy Review, the first installment, as you said, uh, for those who don't know this, this is a, uh, uh, I won't go through the whole entire process, although that was much of the, 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 the magic sauce. Uh, the, um, it was focused on energy infrastructure writ broadly. Uh, and uh, it was a multi-agency, actually 22 agencies were engaged, 22 I think it was, um, uh, and um, made these recommendations. Let me say that, uh, we are, the, the premise was that doing a strongly analytically based document, not based upon what I thought of in the shower this morning, uh, would provide the foundation for a much better dialogue within the administration and with the administration and Congress in particular, not to mention other stakeholders, state energy offices and uh, and, and many others. We've been very pleased that the recommendations in the document uh, have, many of them have found their way directly into uh, bills that have passed Congress last December, uh, the, the budget bill and the uh, highway bill, FAST Act. Uh, they are, there are other recommendations right now in the energy bill that is uh, uh, being discussed in the Senate. Uh, $2 billion were, uh, were authorized uh, along the lines of a recommendation for uh, uh, revitalizing, modernizing the petroleum reserve. So I think the premise of doing something that is viewed as a serious analytical document, hard work, really, really pays off. In terms of the scorecard, uh, we have one. Uh, and um, uh, 
I forget the exact numbers, but give me a give me a hint. Thirty-five, right? Yeah. So of the sixty-three, we consider thirty-five to have been have been have been done. Actually, most of the ones that are directly DOE, we, we have we have executed. But if you want a detailed scorecard, uh, I suggest you have a second discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm Pei. I'm from Belfast Center, and I'm a climate negotiator on behalf of Chinese government on the process of the Paris Agreement as well as the process on consulting the. Uh, U.S. and China presidential statement in 2014 and 2015. So I appreciate so much your political leadership in this process together with other big bosses. My question is very simple and general. Uh, what do you think is the most barriers in the U.S. and China low carbon technology cooperation and what is the best approach to address this kind of barriers given that there's few tangible and real concre uh, concrete uh, uh, result and in the cooperation on low carbon technology between the U.S. and China. Thank you. Well, I think the uh, first of all, I would not, I would not undersell. Uh, by the way, I should also say, it, I think clearly the, uh, I think the the joint announcement by Presidents uh, Xi and Obama in Beijing in October, uh, November 2014, uh, really was in many ways the turning point on the uh, negotiating path to uh, to Paris, uh, and of course. The, the two presidents have continued to work together and uh, make significant statements, including the one about Chinese cap and trade, yes. uh, Graham. Uh, the <laughs> That's one of our side bits. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, I, but then I, I, would not, I would not undersell the um, collaboration um, uh, in the technology space. Uh, the Clean Energy Research Center, uh, which is a joint, joint program, um, is being expanded, in fact, uh, uh, continued and expanded uh, because um, we think it's been, we actually think it's been pretty successful. For, exa and for example, the, in the Clean Energy Research Center, U.S. and China governments each put in a certain amount of uh, funding uh, and uh, it must be at least matched by industry in both countries if we look at the buildings track, for example, uh, the industry funding, I think, has been like six to one, uh, which has shown a lot of interest and, and I think a lot of, a lot of deployment of, of some, some technologies. Uh, so I think there, there's, there is a pro real progress. There is a new track on energy and water that we are just kind of get, getting off the ground. Uh, I think one area where, uh, uh, there is some collaboration, but I would love to see a lot more uh, is in uh, carbon capture uh, and, uh, and, and uh, sequestration where um, uh, I think we could do a lot more together. Uh, in the uh, Obama-Xi announcement in 2014, uh, we did commit to some areas which are moving. For example, uh, one is a first use of carbon dioxide capture for enhanced water recovery. And we have, we have put out our, our, our program plan in, in there. For, so, you know, we can do more. I think the mission innovation doubling of R&D will provide a lot more opportunities uh, uh, to, to move forward. Lady in here. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Arohi Sharma. I'm an MPP1 here at the Kennedy School. And before coming to the Kennedy School, I served as a staffer on Capitol Hill. So since coming here, I've been toying, or grappling with this gap between academics and the realm of policy making, public policy making. So I'd like to take my question to the 30,000 foot level and ask you, in your opinion, what's our obligation as aspiring leaders in the realm of pol public policy in involving the scientific community in policy making decisions? Do we you know, involve them at the 100% level or do we uh, you know, express some concern about involving them in this very potentially polarizing game of politics? Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, the first thing, if you want to be a leader, I would suggest lead. Uh, that would be the first uh, uh, point. But um, no, look, I think, the, I, I think the, the more, I gather you are not a physicist. 
an aspiring physicist? If I could, right, right. If I could no, no. do it all over again. No, no, I just wanted to, yeah, okay. So, no, look, so, look, I think it's very important already in here, the Belfast School would be a good place, MIT's a great place as well, uh, to have these discussions of how science and technology become policy relevant. Uh, I think the key is, it's not a question of getting involved in a polarizing political issue. It's a question of being absolutely analytical uh, and absolutely sticking to the facts and the analysis. And uh, uh, that, uh, I think, is always a safe place to be. Uh, well, I exaggerated. Uh, sometimes it's not, actually. Uh, but, uh, but it's the right place to be. Uh, and, um, no, I th and, and I think, you know, um, um, learning to uh, have that dialogue uh, across these very across very different disciplines, at a uh, tender age, is a good place to start. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen in the lowest, please. Uh, thank you and a good evening. My name is Nan Ma. I'm a graduate student from MIT. Uh, my question is, you know, as we transition to the new t new energy technologies, you know, the industries and the countries in the traditional technology, sorry, traditional you know, like uh, energy sources, they're getting hurt. Now, if we're transitioning too far, you know, there could be some, you know, political chaos in those countries or in some, like, you know, bankruptcies in those industries. So from your point of view, what do you think will be the most optimum strategy for doing the transition to the newer te technology in the energy industry? Thank you. Well, that's a very general uh, question, and obviously individual circumstances uh, matter, matter a lot. But... Um, Look, first of all, uh, I am absolutely convinced that we need to and will uh, uh, move towards a significantly lower carbon uh, economy. Uh, now, in my view, if we could, I'll speak about the United States, if we could have more certainty about particularly a legislative pathway uh, to that lower carbon economy, uh, businesses could function much better. Uh, good business people make money when they know the rules. Now, that doesn't change the fact that there, there, that there will be dislocations. Uh, obviously, in any change, you have a dislocation. Uh, education, training, retraining are very important, but ultimately, uh, a well-educated uh, uh, workforce is, is, is critical to, to finding ways in a, in a evolving economy. And again, it's not just, not, not just true in energy. So, uh, so again, th there will be special circumstances in, in various places. We understand China, for example, right now with the, uh, the closing down of, uh, of um, coal, especially smaller coal plants, uh, the changes they're talking about, they are talking about five million people, five million jobs uh, uh, in, a, at risk, and, and they're struggling with it. I mean, I know, I was just there a few weeks ago, and, and they're struggling with it, and, uh, all, you know, all, again, all, all you can do is, I think, focus on uh, evolving business models, which is critical, and at the, at the uh, uh, level of the workers, uh, ultimately, it's, as I said, education, training, retraining. No, no magic solution. Unfortunately, this gentleman in the lounge gets the last question. Apologies for others, please. Hello, <clears throat> I'm Tom Nagel, and I'm a senior chemical engineering student from Northeastern University. And uh, speaking more towards nuclear energy, uh, the handling of spent nuclear fuel is going to be at a very important part of nuclear energy in the US in the coming future. And as someone, who has worked on molten salt reactor design, handling, uh, and power processing SNF. What are your thoughts on the implementation of this kind of technology that some other countries already have in the US? And do you have your eye on any specific technologies? I mean, in the in molten salt specifically with respect to? Or general uh, generation four reactors. Well, okay. Uh, uh, on the reactor side, uh, uh, certainly we need to continue to uh, developing novel concepts, but I have to make it clear, I think, for you know, quite a long time in terms of deployment, whether it was the right choice or not many years back, the fact is 
it's going to be light water reactors. They may be big ones, they may be smaller ones, but it's going to be light water reactors uh, almost certainly for, for quite a while, uh, given all the regulatory issues that one has to go to for new, uh, new nuclear technologies. There are some very promising concepts, uh, uh, certainly the, the molten salt reactor uh, has been around now for 20 years, uh, uh, need, need some, obviously needs some additional, additional work. We did, by the way, provide $40 million for work on molten salt reactors um, uh, uh, not so long ago. Uh, the, uh, but going to the spent fuel question, which is clearly important, I do want to make the, the, the first point is that there's no magic technology that gets around the fundamental problem. Roughly speaking, you tell me how many kilowatt hours uh, you generated, and I'll tell you how many fission products you have. Uh, so, uh, and that dominates the, uh, the heat and radioactivity for maybe a couple of centuries, let's say. So there's no, there's, there's no way around that. Uh, uh, there are uh, conceptually uh, advanced uh, burner reactors that burn up uh, the long-lived uh, transuranics. Let's just say there's a lot of work to do uh, there. <laughs> And there are some serious questions as to whether it actually makes system sense. And I refer you to the MIT study on the future nuclear fuel cycle from 2011 uh, to look at some of these, some of these dynamics uh, in, in the system. So I think in the end, uh, frankly, I think it's, a, it's a, uh, uh, not new technologies that reduce costs and of course maintain or enhance safety uh, are critical. On the back end, I don't see anything right now that looks any better to me than disposal, geological disposal of spent fuel. So on that note, uh, let me say again, uh, as a citizen, uh, how uh, glad I am for the service. And as a colleague, how proud we are of Ernie. I think the idea of, a, of scientists and, and statescraft is a topic we'll come back to more here to try to learn more about, but as a model, thank you very much. <laughs>